you'll remain standing, I'm going to read from Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1. I'll read the first 21 verses of this book, Judges 1, beginning in verse 1, going through 21. Remember as I read and as you follow along that this is God's Word. Judges 1.1. 1, 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I've given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table, as I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterward, the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, in the Negev, in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, and they defeated Sheshai and Ahaman and Talmai. From there, they went against the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey. And Caleb said to her, what do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing. Since you have set me in the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. And the descendants of the Kenite... Moses' father-in-law went up with the people of Judah from the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah. And he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Let's pray once more. Father, thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we know that these things were written for our instruction. And so instruct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We're embarking on a new study uh, beginning today. Chapel on the book of Judges. And if you haven't read Judges, if you're unfamiliar with the book of Judges, or maybe you're just familiar with a couple of the more famous stories of the Judges who come a little later in the book, I want to begin by giving a brief overview, at least of some of the themes of Judges, not the outline of the book, but some of the major themes that the book of Judges impresses upon us when we read it. First thing I would say is this, the book of Judges gives with exceeding clarity, a picture of the sinfulness of the human heart. It is perhaps one of the most extended narrative treatments of homardiology that we have in the entire Bible. Now, the book of Judges does this in a number of ways. It gives us some specific accounts of things that happened in the history of Israel in this several hundred year period covered by the book. But it also does so, it arranges them in a way that makes a a broader and a a deeper point. Because what the book of Judges does is it arranges things in such a way that we see not only the continued 
of sinfulness and idolatry. And many people have noted this cycle in the book of Judges. In fact, it's pointed out explicitly in chapter 2, but also a kind of downward spiral in the book. So that not only do you see the same mistakes repeated over and over and over again among the people of Israel, but you see the way in which sin takes hold and those repeated mistakes actually have deeper and deeper consequences. And that, that's instructive for us because it really is a, a, a picture of the way in which sin works in the human heart and in the human life. It's not simply that we can look at ourselves and see patterns of sin. It's that actually sin, when it takes hold, gets worse and worse in us. It is both a cycle and a downward spiral. And so that's one of the themes that we're going to see. And we have to be confronted with that theme. It's no accident that God gives us this lengthy account of the people of Israel and then, and then makes it clear as if it wasn't clear enough from its inclusion in the Scriptures, but makes it clear that these things were written for our instruction. So we need to take that instruction seriously. There's also, of course, a major theme in the book, and this gets repeated even more as you get nearer to the end of the book when things are at their darkest and their lowest ebb, this, this theme of the need for a, for a great messianic king. In fact, actually, that's how the book ends. That no king in the land, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. It's a reminder not only of the sinfulness of the human heart, but of the the need for a savior, the need for a king, a king who alone can bring about justice and bring about change in people's heart. It really ultimately points us to Jesus Christ, and it actually does that even in this first chapter, but particularly progresses. As it gets darker and darker, there is only one light that seems to persist when you reach the final chapters, and that's the light of the coming messianic king. Finally, I would mention this. There are other themes we could highlight, but finally I would say that this is, this is a book that really needs to be looked at theocentrically. It's tempting when we come to books like this where there are characters introduced and some heroes who arise. Uh, it's tempting for us to focus primarily on them. And in fact, most of the time when Judges is surveyed or when people remember accounts of the book of Judges, that's what they remember. They remember the main characters. They remember the heroes. And there's something to that, of course, but... I think more importantly, our attention in every chapter and in every account in the book, uh, our attention needs to be fixed on God Himself and what God is doing for His people. In other words, there is a sense in which you should come to every text in Judges and, and recognize God as the main character and ask the question, what is God doing in furthering His purposes? How is God at work in the midst of His people? And you know, that actually leads to some surprising conclusions because what we find is even in the midst of the people's sin, the people's continual sin and disobedience against the Lord, their forgetfulness, their idolatry, their immorality, even in the midst of that, we see that God is still at work. And what a great hope that ought to bring to us. That this book of Judges, perhaps one of the darkest books in the Bible, particularly as you reach the end, can think of very few darker chapters in Scripture than the last chapters of Judges. But even in those darkest chapters, you, you, you take a step back and you look at it and say, God is, is still at work. God is still accomplishing His purposes, even in the midst of His people's disobedience. So there's a great, there's a great lesson there about the sovereignty of God. I want to say several other things by way of background before we Look at this text in question. The, the, the first is this. There are, there are several passages of Scripture, earlier passages of Scripture, that the writer of Judges assumes are fixed in our minds already. Now, this is difficult for us because we don't know our Bibles as well as we should, but the writer of Judges assumes that there are certain passages that are in your bloodstream so that when you come to this book, you, you are prepared for what it is saying in sometimes in subtle ways because, because you know the background material. You, you've done the reading up to this point. 
I want to highlight just one or two of these passages. Obviously, the first one is the book of Joshua because it alludes to that, not alludes, but it actually refers to that at the very beginning when it says, after the death of Joshua, the people inquired of the Lord. And so there's an assumption already in verse 1 that you know what happened in the book of Joshua and you know where the book of Joshua left off. And so that's a baseline assumption of Judges, that you know what happened in the book of Joshua, you know a little bit about the conquest, and you know also that at the end of this conquest, as, as great as it was in some ways, there was a tremendous amount of unfinished business at the end of Joshua. In fact, if you remember Joshua's last speech to the people when he exhorts them to continue in obedience, what he actually says to them as they say that they will obey the Lord is, no, you, you, you won't obey the Lord. You, you can't obey the Lord. You haven't obeyed the Lord up to this point. And then when they persist in saying, no, no, but we will obey the Lord in the future, Joshua has this, this interesting comment where he says, well, how about you start by taking the gods out of your own tents? And so we know at the end of Joshua that the people, although the Lord has been faithful to fulfill His promises, the people are still meddling with idolatry, even in the midst of their own tents, and Joshua knows it too. And so when he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, there is an understanding that while Joshua and his household are wholly committed to the Lord, so many of the people are not. That's assumed. The other thing that's assumed, of course, is the book of Deuteronomy. And particularly, I would highlight in the case of Judges chapter 1, Deuteronomy 28, because in Deuteronomy 28, what Moses highlights is this, that everything good that's happened in the people's lives and in the people's redemption from slavery in Egypt, all of it has been because of God's work. Moses is a monergist in his understanding of salvation. And Moses makes it clear in those first verses of Deuteronomy 28, every, at every single step of the way, when you look at, the, at what you've been given, when you look at what you've been blessed with, don't think you did it. God did it for you. In fact, at one point in the middle, even when discussing the wilderness years, he says, haven't you even noticed in the wilderness your shoes haven't worn out? And God's fed you every step of the way. In other words, it's everything, everything you have, you owe to God. And then he goes on to say the reason why he did this was that you would be a light to the nations, that you would be different from the other nations. And both of those themes come up in Judges chapter 1 because what we see is the people are more like the nations than they care to admit. And they easily forget that the Lord has provided for them in the past. Last passage I'll mention, and then we'll look at this text in particular. The last passage that we must have in our minds, even to understand the structure of these first chapters of Judges, is Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis 49, Jacob blesses his sons, who become the tribes, of course, of Israel, who are mentioned here and are mentioned in the book of Joshua. And, and if you know the blessing of Jacob, you know that there's a, there's a kind of inherent tension in that blessing because he gives this great blessing to a son who in previous chapters of Genesis has shown himself to be unfaithful, although repentant. We see this great promise given to Judah amidst Judah's sin in Genesis 38. And, and, and what is said of Judah is that the scepter will not depart from Judah. And that the Lord will ultimately provide His messianic king through the tribe of Judah. There are other promises as well. He gives some more enigmatic but nonetheless profound promises to the sons of Joseph. And to Benjamin, who's mentioned here in verse 21, he gives a very harsh assessment. Which is surprising because, of course, Benjamin was a beloved son of Jacob. So all of that background from Genesis 49 plays into Judges chapter 1 and plays into the Lord's dealings with His people. It's, it's sort of like a, 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 a story the, in which the ending is given to us, or at least a part of the ending is given at the beginning. You think of Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, where he introduces Romeo and Juliet as star-crossed lovers, right? At the, and you know Something bad is about to happen. Well, it's something like that with Judah and Benjamin when we come to Judges 1. Well, let's look at this text then with the time we have remaining. There are three accounts here in Judges 1, but they all really center on Judah and on Judah's conquest of the land. The first account comes in verses 1 through 10, and it is an account of God's justice 
in working through this uh, tribe of Judah. Uh, we see the beginning, of course, it's after the death of Joshua. And the question is, who's going to go defeat the Canaanites? Now, the fact that the Canaanites still need defeating reminds you of all the unfinished business in the book of Joshua. It is not an account of this unbridled success on the part of the people. In fact, there are many instances of failure in Joshua. And so that's clear at the beginning. But the Lord responds and the Lord says that Judah shall go up. And that, that's a reminder again that in Genesis 49, Judah takes pride of place. And Judah has a, a Simeon come along with him in his conquest in verse 3, Simeon, of course, had been granted land within the tribal allotment of Judah. Jo Joshua 19 tells us that. And Simeon also, if we go back to the book of Genesis, had the same mother as Judah. So there are some connections there, some very important connections. And Judah and Simeon go up and go to the territory of the Canaanites, where the Canaanites are living. And in verse 4, it tells us what happened. Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. Now this, again, needs to jump out at us, because every victory in Joshua and Judges, going all the way to me, the victory is the Lord's. The salvation comes from God Himself. We need to look at the examples of the tribes. We need to look at the examples of the judges. But ultimately, the victory is the Lord's. And to the extent that the people begin to forget that, they slide into greater and greater disobedience. Now, there's a particular king who is destroyed in this uh, account, or at least defeated in this account, this king Adonai Bezek. That means, of course, the Lord of Bezek. It's a, it's, it's a title, really, uh, of this great king. And it's striking to see the, the inter, introduction here of, of speech. In other words, like a character speaking. And the character who speaks here is actually a pagan king. And look at what he says. Of course, I read the account already. Adonai Bezek flees. They catch up with him. And they cut off his thumbs and his big toes, which would have been a way of signaling uh, the, his, his utter humiliation and enslavement and keeping him from further war against them. And Adonai Bezek says something here. Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table as I have done, so God has repaid me. And that's why I highlight here the justice of God through Judah. Because Adonai Bezek, this pagan king, sees his own defeat as a, as a just response on behalf of God. You remember even back in the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 15, he said that you're going to be 400 years in Egypt because the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its, its full completion. And here we have this, this pagan king, this wicked king. And when he's defeated, he recognizes this of God in his defeat. Well, then we get a further account of the work of the men of Judah. They go down from Jerusalem to the hill country in the Negev. It's striking that they take Jerusalem here. Uh, Joshua didn't fully take Jerusalem, and, and, and Caleb is given Hebron in Joshua 15, but here's the record of, of the conquest of Hebron. So they, they are able to defeat Jerusalem. They're able to defeat uh, Hebron, and this is a, a significant victory and a fulfillment of the Lord's promise. And of course, we know why it is that they're able to defeat it. Going back to verse 4, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. That's the first account. And the second account is, a, is an account of, of great personal courage, but it's, a, it's an ambiguous kind of courage. It begins in verse 11, and it starts with Caleb. And we've been introducing Eddie and Joshua. He was, of course, one of the spies who returned a good report, and the Lord blessed him for that. He's given an inheritance in the land. In the book of Joshua, he is the model settler. He's the one who is always obedient to the Lord, knows exactly what God's commanded, and trusts God to actually do what he says. Now, here he does something, I think, that is slightly ambiguous. What he does is in verse 12, he sees Kiriath Sefer, and he says, whoever comes and captures I'll give my daughter to, this daughter, Oxen. And Othniel, who's going to be introduced as a great judge uh, just a little bit later in the book, steps forward and, and takes the challenge. And he goes and he attacks Kiriath-sephir and he does capture it and he's given 
Aksa, his wife. Then there might be a question, though, at this point. There is a kind of ambiguity to this because we could wonder why it was that, that Caleb didn't lead the charge himself. Well, perhaps he's being wise here. That's possible. The text doesn't really tell us. And then there's even further ambiguity because Aksa, his daughter, asks her uh, father for, for e even greater blessing. In fact, she actually tells her husband to ask her father. He doesn't appear to do that. And so then she said in verse 15, Give me a blessing since you've set me in the land of the Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb does it. Now, as I say, there's a little bit of tension here. On the one hand, we have to say, Aksa, like Caleb, her father, shows great confidence in God's provision. She asks for a great blessing, and it's provided to her. What an example of faith. But, but there is a, another side to it as well, uh, which is the question of Othniel not asking, and, and Caleb offering her up as a, as a reward. And, and I would simply say this, while there may be ambiguity and could be looked at in different ways, this account is a, is a kind of troubling foreshadowing of things to come in the book of Judges. Because what we will see in Judges is one of the signs of the failure of the people, is that those who should not have had to participate in the conquest, should not have had to take the lead, as it were, or are forced to take the lead. Now, now perhaps that's not exactly what's happening here, but, but it's close to what's happening here. And it's something that we will see in a more pronounced way. And I'll tell you that at the end of the book, one of the great signs of God's judgment is not only are the people who should have been leading not leading, but actually the people who should have been leading are giving up their care for the worst kinds. Of and I wonder if even in chapter 1, there is a hint of this in the midst of this great faithfulness, and great victory. Well, in any case, there's a third account here. This account is at the center, and there's a third account that's given to us beginning in verse 18. It says, Judah also captured Gaza with its territory, and Ashkelon with its territory, and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Now here we're beginning to see something else, an account of early compromise. Uh, Judah, no doubt, is mostly successful. In fact, it's looked at as a great success, a great conquest. But there is a note here that Judah, while in verse uh, 17, they devoted Zephath to destruction, in verse 18, they simply capture Gaza and Ashkelon and Ekron, these three Philistine cities. And then when it comes to the, the inhabitants of the plain just next to the hill country, they, they don't drive them out. They, they can't drive them out. And that compromise has its greatest expression in the description of Benjamin in verse 21. The people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been captured, but the Benjamites didn't finish job. The Jebusites resettled it and Benjamin lived in the shadow of Jerusalem. And it says to this day, we know that it wasn't until the time of David that the Jebusites are driven out. And this early compromise is so for this section to end on. It's defeat snatched from the jaws of victory. It's a reminder early on in this book that you can't make any compromise on the commands of God, uh, that the people of God, even, even in the case of small compromises, would suffer grave consequences. It is notable that they didn't totally destroy Gaza, Ashkelon, and Ekron. It's notable that they, they didn't drive out the, the people of the plain. And it's surely notable that Benjamin couldn't even take all of Jerusalem. You know, I think this is something the judges teaches us perhaps most vividly. You can't compromise on the commands of God. You can't compromise with sin or with full obedience. We know, of course, that often quoted line from 
John Owen, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. We could almost say if they're not going to be killing the Philistines or the Jebusites, then we can be sure that not too long after this, the Jebusites and the Philistines will be killing them. I want to just spend a moment with this because I, I think it's always worth mentioning that some of you are content in living with sin, in compromising with sin. Perhaps it seems like in small ways, in, in hidden ways. No one else has found out. It's occasional. It's, it's not something significant in your own mind. Or, or you compare yourself to someone else. I haven't compromised as much as others that I know. These compromises can take all kinds of shapes and forms. It could be any kind of sin. But I tell you, this small compromise in Judges 1 will grow into a, a, a great war, it will lead to all kinds of destruction, greater sin further on in the book. You, you, you think that somehow these small things are, are not significant in your life. But Judges shows you just how significant they are. I would say actually one of my prayers in looking at the book of Judges in whatever time the Lord gives to us is to shock you of this position that you have towards sin. This sense that you have that you can live alongside it, coddle it and keep it or excuse it or ignore it altogether. Now, the book of Judges teaches us the seriousness of all these things. Well, I want to just make a few brief applications with the time we have remaining. As I mentioned at the beginning, the New Testament's clear. These things, all of these things, from Adonai Bezek to Aksa to the people of Benjamin, all of these things happened as examples for us upon whom the end of the ages have fallen. And if I could just give a couple of applications of these examples. First, I think we can say this. There is justice and wisdom in God's dealings with His people. I do think it's striking that the first quote that we get, the first person to speak, as it were, apart from the Lord, the first human to speak in the book of Judges is Adonai Bezek, this pagan godless king. And what does he speak of? Well, he says, all of this is just. I've done the same thing, and now it's being done to me. Now, he's not a repentant man. He's not a believing man. But he recognizes, even he recognizes, the judgment and justice and wisdom of God. second thing I would point out, and this really has to do with that middle section with Caleb and Aksa and Othniel, is the great burden, and I think this is emphasized throughout Judges, the great burden of leadership. And the great importance of not compromising in the midst of leadership. Look, ambiguous decisions, decisions that are perhaps a gray area, may lead to apparent success. It may be that the job gets done anyway. But it's a dangerous pattern to succumb to. Again, without judging with certainty what happens in this chapter, we can judge with absolute certainty the way in which these kinds of decisions play out in future chapters. It's an ominous warning sign that even Caleb might be susceptible to. Ambiguity turns into outright sin very quickly. Thirdly, I would say this, these three incidents indicate to us the importance of following God's word to the letter. These people were largely successful. The, the tribe of Judah perhaps did 90% of what God told them to do. But 90% is not full obedience. That 10%, the thorn in the side of Israel. Think of think how much trouble just the Philistines alone cause all the way into the reign of David. Where does that begin? Well, it begins with verse 18. They captured Gaza and Ashkelon and Ekron but they didn't utterly destroy it. And we could say the same of the Jebusites and Benjamin. But I would lastly say this by way of application. This chapter, as ominous and as convicting as it is, and the other chapters 
perhaps or even more so, also illustrates for us the greatness and the, the, the wonder of God's grace among His people. I'll point your attention again to verse 4, but I'll remind you of what we read in the New Testament. What do you have that you did not receive? Every good and perfect gift comes from above. When we see the, the victories that are won, that are outlined here, we, we have to say almost immediately as we see them, praise be to God. To God alone be the glory. He's the one who does these great things. But we're in such danger when we, when we do have some measure of success, when we do have some measure of health, when we do have some measure of ease, and we all have that to some degree. We're in such, such spiritual danger then that we say to ourselves that what Nebuchadnezzar says, I with my hands have done this. No, it's always the grace of God from beginning to end. It's God who is the one who wins the victory. And I'll say this, there's one more, perhaps even more pointed illustration of the grace of God. This book of Judges gives us sobering reminders and warnings. It's, it's an arresting book. It should be arresting. If it's not arresting to you, you're not reflecting on it. Your heart is too hard to see what is plainly in front of your face on the pages of your Bible. But it's also filled with hope. And one of the reminders of chapter 1, and it is, it is instructive that it is in chapter 1, right at the beginning of the book, right when we start. It's instructive that in the midst of sin, we can say, just based on these first 21 verses of Judges 1, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. We can say, even from this early chapter, that God work glorifying His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and glorifying His Son, that all peoples will one day say at least what Adam says. They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this book that You've given to us. We do ask for conviction of sin. We ask that we would glorify Christ even more. We ask that you would teach us in and through your word. We thank you for doing that by your spirit. And we pray that your spirit might continue to be at work in us. In Jesus' name, amen.